I have uh, three things to talk about with regard to climate change, and um, the, some of you have already heard my story before, so you'll be, you'll be familiar. All three things that I'm gonna talk about start with the letter S, so it makes it easy to remember. The three S's of climate change are simple, serious, and solvable. And it's important to do all three S's. I try to, in, in every uh, interaction, try to do all three S's. So for example, um, I teach an undergraduate course at CSU um, where, where we talk about this for 15 weeks and, and you get sort of five weeks of simple and five weeks of serious and five weeks of solvable. Uh, you're not gonna be subjected to that. You know, you're only here for like 45 minutes, so maybe 15 of each. Um, on the other hand, people will ask me on an airplane, uh, what, what do you do? And I tell them and they say, oh, what, what do you think about climate change? And I figure I got 30 seconds and I give them about 10 seconds of simple and 10 seconds of serious and 10 seconds of solve. No, no, nobody really likes to talk about the serious stuff. That, that's the part that is, I mean, you could call it scary, right? There's other things that start with S that we could call that. But the, the middle S is, is the, the sad part and you, you have to talk about it, so we will. Um, but I think it's important then to move to the solvable and, and uh, wrap up with, with things that we can do. Because if you just sort of beat people over the head with how scary it is, um, they, they tend to just want to go home and cry or, or have a drink or something and, and rather than actually doing anything about it. So, um, all right, I'm going to have to get the hang of this thing. Let's see, let's try that again. Oh yeah, there we go. Simple, serious, and solvable. Kind of odd that I would say this is simple um, because you know, I've been doing this professionally for 30 years, and if it's so simple, how come I still have a job? Um, but it turns out that the science of climate change, although there is this kind of rocket science-y uh, part of it that, that people um, have fun learning about, uh, the, the basic nut of how this works is something that you all learned in grade school. And so I just want to kind of remind you of that rather than sort of think of this as something that, you know, needs supercomputers and satellites and all that stuff. Um, so let me just ask, you ever wonder why day is warmer than night? You ever wonder why summer is warmer than winter or Phoenix is warmer than Fargo? Um, it turns out that the answer in all three cases is the same answer. It's because heat in minus heat out equals change of heat. Okay, so, so when you put more heat into something than you take out, it warms up. When you take more heat out of something than you put in, it cools off. And you, you, you all have experienced this, right? The sun comes up in the morning and it beats down on the ground and lo and behold, it warms up. Sun goes down at night, all that heat radiates back out, space cools off. This is not, not mysterious. We actually know how this works. Anybody who's been around on the world for a, a while has experienced that stuff. Now, day to day, um, there's a whole lot of big changes. I don't know, this week was a pretty good one, right? That on uh, Tuesday, it was 78 degrees in Fort Collins, and on Wednesday, yesterday, uh, we had about six inches of snow in my backyard, and about half of it melted as it was falling, so it probably would have been a foot if it hadn't have been melting because the ground was so warm. Now, that's not climate change, right? That's from one day to the next. That's just the weather. And that's because heat comes in and out sideways, right? The, the, the air that was here on Tuesday blew away somewhere, someplace far away, and, and it was replaced with another blob of air that came from the north and was really freezing cold, and, uh, and that stuff happens all the time, I mean, especially Colorado in the springtime. Um, but, but when you look at the whole world, there, there are no sides, okay? The, the, you can't have sideways, the, the, the heat comes in and out of here all the time sideways, but, but the heat for the whole planet, because the planet's round, you, you move the stuff around sideways all you want, doesn't change the amount of heat. The only way to change the amount of heat for the world is through the top. And you're not used to thinking of the world as having a top, but it does. It's the top of the atmosphere. And the only way we can get heat into the world is, is through that top. But if that was the whole, now, okay, this is a quiz, right? I'm a professor, you can't help it. But, but, uh, we, from where does the heat, where, where does the heat come from that comes into the top of the atmosphere? Where, where, where does it come from? Sun. The sun, right on. So if that was the whole story, right, heat in minus heat out equals change of heat, that's just heat in, heat in, heat in, the world would just get hotter and hotter and hotter until it like melted and boiled and vaporized and that'd be the end of things. But luckily that's not the whole story because there's heat going out too. 
You can see the heat coming in, but you can't see the heat going out. The heat going out is invisible. It's infrared, you know, redder than red. And, and it beams out into space. And if the sunshine coming in is more than the infrared going out, then the heat it warms up. Heat in minus heat out, it's a change of heat, right? Just like put a pot of water on a stove and you put heat into the bottom of that pot of water, lo and behold, it warms up, right? Same thing with the earth. The more heat comes in and goes out, it warms up. Now, when heat goes out to space, this is the part maybe you didn't learn in high school, but bear with me. It's got to pass through the air. And the air is made of gas. And the gas in the air is almost all of it. It's two kinds of gas. You guys, no, I won't ask you. It's nitrogen and oxygen. Very good. So, so you know, everybody knows about oxygen. If you don't know about oxygen, just hold your breath until I, yeah, never mind. Um, but those two gases are diatomic gases, two, two molecules, two atoms of the same gas, same element, glommed together with shared electrons, never mind that part. So along comes this infrared radiation. Why am I doing this with my hand? It's because it's waves, right? It's electromagnetic waves carrying the energy out to space. And the uh, shared electrons in that molecule can, because they're negatively charged, they, they actually sort of oscillate back and forth with the, uh, the wave of IR going past. And kind of go, woo, 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 woo. It doesn't really make that sound. I just make that part up. <laughs> but the woo, woo, woo thing is an excited molecule. We anthropomorphize molecules, see. And, and that excited molecule can then de-excite by, boom, sends off a photon at that same energy level, and, and that photon will go off. But because 99% of the molecules in the air are oxygen and nitrogen, diatomic molecules, this is the only dance they know. It's the only way they can wiggle. It's the only way you can rearrange the geometry of an, a molecule that's made of two atoms of the same thing. Now there's a tiny, tiny bit of other gases in the air, primarily CO2 and water vapor, carbon dioxide and water vapor, that don't have two atoms, they have three atoms. So CO2, only got the two hands, let's CO2, okay, carbon dioxide. Along comes this electromagnetic wave, right? But so the electrons can wiggle and go woo 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 back to its ground state, whoa, 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 but there's more. Because unlike O2 and N2, it can go each one of these different ways of wiggling that molecule will absorb a slightly different wavelength of infrared light, a slightly different energy level of photon. That's what makes CO2 a greenhouse gas. It's not because of greed or capitalism or Al Gore, it's just bad luck that the gas that comes out when you set carbon on fire has this, this thing that it can do that absorbs the outgoing heat and re-radiates it and keeps us warm. And in fact, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for these, these very small number of these molecules in the sky, our Earth would lose so much heat to space that the oceans would freeze. And this would be an ice ball planet, you know, like the ice planet Hoth in Star Wars, and, and we never would have evolved here. So, so we owe our very lives to the fact that these molecules can do this thing. Um, but if we put more of those molecules up there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to absorb more of the heat, and then heat in minus heat out makes change of heat, and that's why we warm up. So that's the whole story of climate change. So common sense um, explanation. You, you see what that is up there? That's a, a, a light bulb. So the, remember those light bulbs? Many of you are old enough to remember incandescent light bulbs. Uh, those particular ones were the four watt lights, you know, back when I was a boy, they were, they were Christmas tree lights. And then when my kids were little, we used them for night lights that they could find the bathroom, right? In the night, you have them like by the floor in the, in the hallway. Four watts, four watt light, night light bulb. And if you double the number of beep, boop, beep, boop molecules in the sky, the amount of CO2 in the, in the air, that would add this much extra heat to every square meter of the world. So we got these nice recycled carpet tiles here in this lovely church. I think about four of those tiles is a square meter. So you can imagine a four watt light bulb there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. But it wouldn't just be this room, be the entire world covered with four watt light bulbs every three feet, okay? You're gonna put those lights on, you're gonna leave those lights on forever. 
Like all day, all night, 365 days a year, those light bulbs would be on. Now, if you did that, the world would be a little bit warmer, right? Maybe not a whole lot, because they're just little four-hour light bulbs, but, but for sure not zero if you had little four-hour light bulbs every three feet. And that's, that's how we know about global warming. Believe it or not, all of what I just told you was known before light bulbs were invented. This was first discovered in the 1860s. When Abraham Lincoln was president, people put CO2 in a bottle, in, in a glass jar, and they shined infrared light through that glass, through the, the jar, through the gas, and they measured how much of that infrared light was absorbed by the CO2. And they figured out that that's what was keeping us warm. And they actually predicted famously 150 years ago that if we continue burning coal and put CO2 up in the air, that it will warm the planet. So this is not something we just discovered recently. A lot of people think, you know, well, it got warm. And people wondered why, how, what's causing that. And then they noticed the CO2 was going up and they did some kind of correlation. And they said, oh, it must be the CO2. Uh-uh. We knew this before the CO2 went up. We knew it before it got warm. Uh, in fact, it's kind of the most common myth of all. Uh, everybody's seen these graphs, right? It used to be colder, and then it got hotter, and then it got hotter a whole bunch faster. And that's true. It, it did all that. But, but that's not how we figured it out. Scientists knew this was going to happen 150 years ago and predicted it in print and all that. The guy won the Nobel Prize for it in 1896, believe it or not. So really, we know that adding CO2 to the air will warm the climate because we know that when you put heat into things, they change their temperature. Okay, that, that's, you know, that's the first law of thermodynamics. But you, you got to be some sort of egotistical Victorian Brit to call something that simple the first law of thermodynamics. I mean, you know, cavemen knew that. They, they put the mammoth on the fire and it got hot. But they didn't say first law of thermodynamics. They said, ugh, hot. So, so we, we know about global warming because we understand the law of ugh, hot. Okay, that's the simple part. Now we got to talk about the serious part, and, and nobody likes this. So bear with me. I know that it's unpleasant, but I promise you we'll get to the third S. So hang in there. People have been throwing around this number, one and a half degrees C, right? We want to hold global warming to one and a half degrees C. The Paris Agreement said uh, the countries of the world, almost every country on Earth, agreed to hold global warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. That's the global average temperature at the surface. Uh, no more than two degrees Celsius above what it was in pre-industrial times. And then they had another sort of clause in the agreement that said, well, if we can get away with it, we're going to do one and a half. We'd really rather do one and a half, but two if we, if we have to. Did you know if, if we don't do anything about this, then by the end of this century, it's probably more like about four, and by the end of the next century, maybe closer to seven degrees above uh, pre-industrial. Now, there's kind of more here than I want to talk about, but, but um, just so you know, I mean, nobody knows what the, I know, I'm an atmospheric scientist, but you, you don't know what the, anybody know what the global average temperature is? 15 Celsius. Oh, very good. So, uh, yeah, about, about 15 Celsius, which, which is uh, right, right around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, if you warm the world, a little bit. We have warmed the world a little bit. We've warmed the world about one degree Celsius so far. But the oceans warm up much less because the oceans are ginormous, right? The oceans, did you know the oceans on the average 13,000 feet deep? So it takes a boatload of light bulbs to, to warm the ocean by one degree. So for the whole world to warm up by one degree C, the land has to warm up quite a bit more than one degree C because the ocean's not really doing much. So the, the land warms up maybe 60% more than the, than the globe as a whole. Now, where do you live? Do you live on land or the oceans? Oh, land. So, so you get more than global warming. You get about half again. Now, it happens to be that the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean, the northern hemisphere is mostly land. So the southern hemisphere warms up very slowly because it's all water, and the northern hemisphere warms up much quicker. And then the third thing is if, if you happen to live where it snows, you get extra because the snow reflects the sun, 
And if you warm up enough to melt the snow, then it soaks up some extra sun and that gets added to the four watts of heat that you get from the, from the little light bulb. So if you live on land in the northern hemisphere where it snows, you, you get more than global warming, you get, you get extra. Um, so let me, let me just go with four degrees is sort of our t year 2100, you know, if we don't do something about it, seven degrees if we go to 2200. Multiply that by one and a half, that's six degrees C by 2100. Oh, but wait, those are Celsius, right? You, you guys probably all do Fahrenheit. You know, the only reason I do Celsius is because I'm a scientist, and even, you know, even scientists do Fahrenheit at home. Um, <laughs> so so did you probably remember, maybe you remember this from somewhere, you, you do this uh, 1.8, you gotta multiply the, the Celsius degrees by 1.8 to get Fahrenheit degrees. So six degrees Celsius about 11 Fahrenheit-ish. Um, so 11 degrees is, is how much warming by the end of the century for, for this part of the world. And sure enough, that's just about what all the maps show. It's about, let's call it 10, just for round numbers. So, so the thing we're trying to avoid is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Now, I don't know, what was it, 40 today? And I probably would have been perfectly happy if it was 50, right? Let, let's face it, it's April, I'm about ready for spring. Um, but we're not just talking about today. We're talking about on the average 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's even hard to get your head around what that means, even though you know, we live here in Denver and we you know, pay attention to the temperatures and stuff. So here's a map of uh, average high temperatures in the United States in Fahrenheit degrees, which is the ones you're used to. And each color on the map is five degrees Fahrenheit different from the color next to it. And I have a dot there for Denver and I got some other dots for other cities. And if we slide them all two colors on the map, holy cromboli, that's actually quite a lot. That's like moving to Albuquerque, okay? So 10 degrees Fahrenheit is like moving from here to Albuquerque. If, you, if you're a farmer in Illinois, it's like moving to Mississippi. If you live on the East Coast, it's like moving something like 800 miles to the South. So this is actually a lot. When, when we say 10 degrees Fahrenheit, we're, we're talking like driving all day South and think about the climate of, of Albuquerque, it's different than it is here. If you swapped out the climate of Albuquerque for the climate of, of Eastern Colorado, those farmers would notice that. It, it, it isn't a small number. Now around here, we don't have to drive 12 hours to find different climate, right? We just drive uphill. <laughs> and so if you think about, you know, all our different zones in the mountains, we got the grasslands and we got the ponderosas and then you got the lodgepole and then you got the spruce fir and, and then you got the tundra and all that, right? Everybody's been up there. Um, each 10 degrees Fahrenheit is about 3,000 feet of elevation, right? So if you, if you drive uphill 3,000 feet, uh, that's a place where the temperature, average temperature is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than, than where you are. So if we warm up 10 degrees Fahrenheit in Colorado, that's like taking the temperature of Denver and putting it up in Estes Park, right? Or it's like taking the temperature of Estes Park and putting it up on Trail Ridge Road. Um, holy moly, that's a lot. That's, that, it's really different between here and, and Estes or, or Estes and Trail Ridge. Now at the end of the last ice age, all of those, that's almost exactly what happened. It was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit of warming and, and all of those zones moved up the mountain. You can sort of imagine it, right? The uh, ice melted in Canada and, and you know, the trees marched up the mountain. I mean, you don't really march, right? They, they, don't, they don't do that. But, but they, they, they seed and then the new trees grow and then those trees die and then the seeds and so forth. And, and they come up, up the mountain. And so like these zones moved up 3,000 feet at the end of the last ice age. It took 10,000 years for that warming to happen at the end of the last ice age. 10,000, from about 18,000 years ago to about 8,000 years ago, uh, there was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit warming. And we're talking about having that much warming in one century. Not, not 100 centuries, one century. Now, there, there is no time to grow new trees a little bit at a time. They, they, they don't, it's not like in Lord of the Rings where they, you know, walk up the mountain. They, they, they have to grow by, by seeding and, and growing and dying and seeding and growing. So they, there is no way for the trees and, and animals and other plants and so forth to keep up 
with the zones moving up the mountain like that. It's, it's bad when, when you warm. It's 100 times faster than the warming at the end of the last ice age. Now, we happen to live in a place that's particularly sensitive to this because it's dry here, right? No, no, no news to you folks. You, you know about this. There's the map up here of uh, average precipitation in the western United States. And, you know, in, in real life, if you drove all the way across to California, you know that it's mostly brown, and it's mostly brown on the map. And those are places where it rains like 10 inches a year. It rains maybe 15 inches a year here in, in eastern Colorado. And believe it or not, 75 million people live in the area covered by that map. I know, how the heck can we get uh, support like the economy of 75 million people in a place that only gets 10 inches of rain. The reason is because all those blue and green places on the map, you know what those places are called? Mountains. That's exactly right. Because the mountains stick way the heck up in the sky, and when the water vapor blows past, it converts that, that water vapor into, into snowpack. And the snowpack accumulates all winter long, and then about this time of year, it starts to melt, and it runs down gently and, you know, down the streams and rivers and it fills up our reservoirs. And that's exactly what we live off of, is we, we live off of that snowpack. And if you swap out the temperature of, of our mountains for the temperature of Denver, what do you think is going to happen to all that water, all that snow? We're going to get rain instead of snow. It doesn't do this annual runoff thing. It's harder to manage. Um, we, we would miss that water. Another thing about warming in our region is fire. Uh, so, so the way our forests work is uh, there's all this snow right now up there in the high country, and it's starting to melt. And so there's this big slug of water goes into the soil in May, year after year, and all the little soil pores are full of water. And then um, summer comes, and the trees have their roots down in that pool of water that was from melted snow, and all summer long, uh, the water evaporates out of the needles and it's replaced by water that's sucked up out of the roots out of that snow melt that's in the soil. And it's a big sort of annual cycle of, of the lives of trees. Um, if you warm the climate of, of our mountains to be the climate of Denver, a lot more water evaporates out of those needles every day. So they wind up running out of water earlier in the season and you know how it is if you go hiking in like August, September, the ground's all kind of crunchy underfoot. And those are the times when the fire danger is, is much higher. Um, so just having warmer air increases the evaporative demand on the forest, then you wind up having more, more fire danger. The next thing is that in a warmer climate, the fire season is longer. The evaporation season, let's call it, is, is much longer. So we start actually having, we, we had a red flag warning on Monday here uh, in the Front Range. Um, 80 degrees on Tuesday and a big blizzard on Wednesday, but that's par for the course. Those early uh, hot weather hit earlier and the, the late season warm weather hits later. So you, instead of just going for fire season in July and August, you start having like you know May, June, July, August, September, October, you get these longer fire seasons. So there's more problem there. And the third thing is you know those really bad days in the summer where it's like 99 degrees in the shade and 5% relative humidity and it's windy? And, and those are the days when the fire skips the fire line and they evacuate the firefighters and it comes down into the neighborhoods and it burns out you know, hundreds of homes. Those kinds of days happen much more often in a hot year than they do in a cold year. So for all three of these reasons, there's much more uh, wildfire as the temperature goes up. And any wildfire scientist will tell you that, that the, there's a correlation between uh, acres burned and, and temperature in a given year. Um, the US uh, National Academy of Science commissioned a study that was published in 2011 that looked at wildfire risk in the, in the West under global warming. But you see those like kind of bruised colors on the map, that's where we live. Um, in our part of the mountains, we expect about a 600% increase in wildfire per one degree Celsius of warming. So if we're gonna have four degrees Celsius of warming, that's like a 2,400% increase in wildfire in our part of the world. That's terrifying. It, it, it comes to the point where it's not even about how much can burn, it's about how quick does the forest grow back. 
right? Because if you have, I mean, currently we have like a 200 year fire return time. And if you shrink that down to 20 years instead of 200 years, if you have a fire every 20 years, there's no time to grow the trees back. They, they don't ever grow back. And you don't, you convert the land from being a forest to being something else. And it's not necessarily going to be nice what, what the new stuff that grows in. So this is kind of scary. And not just for the forest, although it's terrible for the forest, but it's also bad for us because we're breathing the smoke down here. This is not a prediction. This is just a what if. What if... Uh, we don't do anything about this till the year 2100. So um, what, what this calculation shows on the bottom graph is CO2 emissions. Now, these graphs go from the year 1800, like, you know, Thomas Jefferson was president, to the year 2300. Now, nobody, that, that's an awful long time. It's 500 years, right? J just for grins. Um, the year 2300 is like halfway between Captain Kirk and Jean-Luc Picard, okay? <laughs> so it's way out there in the future. Um, so we're going from Thomas Jefferson to Jean-Luc Picard. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, and the, the lower graph shows CO2 emissions historically up until that green dot that says you are here. And then I just went ahead and used the UN projections for sort of a business as usual scenario until the year 2100. And on, on January 1st of 2100, Happy New Year, it's like we turn it off, okay? Emissions go to zero um, after that. And so in the blue curve on top, you see what happens to the CO2. And the CO2, you know, see where you are here? It hasn't really done much yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. But if, if we went up that, that emissions curve that's shown there, uh, that, blue, that red, sorry, blue curve is gonna go way up high and then we stop burning the stuff, but look at the CO2 doesn't go away. So, so this is something that maybe not everybody understands, that, that when we talk about air pollution, you guys use the word carbon pollution in here, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say, but, but brown cloud pollution, smog, the kind of stuff that we have down, down here in Front Range, the, the reason that stuff is bad is because it's chemically reactive. It gets into your eyes, it gets into your sinuses, you can feel it, right? On a, on a bad smog day, you can actually, it feels like, like it's burning in there, because it is. Um, if you've ever been to like Beijing or, or New Delhi, oh my God, it's, it's incredible how, how it, it literally hurts to, to have that stuff touch your, your wet parts. But the, uh, the difference with CO2 is that it's not chemically reactive. It, it does not react with anything. It, it's inert once it gets in the air. And so it doesn't go away. Now the brown cloud on, on Saturday will be a lot less than it was on Friday because there's no rush hour traffic. And, and as long as you're not putting it in the air, it's just dissipating and, and turning into other stuff because it's reacting chemically with the air and turning into other stuff. But CO2 is not like that. CO2 is, I, I like to say it's completely oxidized, right? It's the last thermodynamic ashes of the carbon cycle. All the energy's been wrung out of it, ain't nothing left but, but carbon and oxygen. So there's, there is no reaction for it to do. So it just stays up there. Only way to get rid of it is to dissolve it into the oceans. And the oceans are, are vast, right? Davy Jones locker. And, and only the top part of the oceans are touching the atmosphere and they can react with the CO2, but the big body of the ocean, 95% of the mass of the ocean, never sees the, the, the air. It's, it's down there in Davy Jones Lock, it doesn't touch. So it takes millennia for that stuff to circulate and eventually take the CO2 out of the air. Well, it ain't happening in centuries. Jean-Luc Picard is just SOL. So, so anyway, then the warming is the red line. You see that basically the temperature goes up because we burn all this coal, oil, and gas, and then it doesn't ever come down. Even though we stop burning the stuff, it doesn't come down. So this is a problem for the ages. The, the common myth is when we reduce or stop burning fossil fuel, the CO2 will go away. Now, it's dangerous for me to even tell you a myth, right? Because now you're going to remember the myth. So, eh, I'm telling you something's not true, okay? It's not true that when you stop burning it, it goes away. It doesn't go away for a really, really long time. So if China and India and Africa build modern economies based on coal, oil, and gas, 
wow, the CO2 goes way up and it doesn't come back down. The CO2 will be around for thousands and thousands of years after we're done. So this is a, it's like a thermostat that's got a ratchet on it. You can turn it up, but you can't turn it back down. Once you've turned it up, it's just permanently up. It's bad. It's a really big problem. And I want to talk a little bit about, um, because it's a church, because I'm not just representing CSU, I'm also representing Foothills Unitarian Church. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, my colleague, Kathleen Dean Moore, who is a philosopher. She's written this book called Moral Ground. Amazing book. You should get a hold of this book. Uh, this is basically a collection of essays. She asked about 100 prominent thinkers the question, do we have a moral obligation to future people? And asked them to just think about it for you know, two pages or whatever. And oh my gosh, she's got essays in there from the Pope. She's got an essay from the Dalai Lama. She's got an essay from Barack Obama. Uh, she has amazing philosophers and religious thinkers and all over the planet. About 100 of these essays collected in this book. And I went, went, served on a panel with her and she told me that scientists and politicians are missing something important when we talk about climate change. She calls it the second premise. Okay, so this is philosophy. So, sorry, but you know, so, this is like college, right? Uh, premise number one, science says, this is the way the world is. Premise number three, policy says, therefore, this is what we will do. And she says, you guys are, are missing something. There's something in between one and three, the missing premise. Well, what you're going is from one premise to the conclusion. This is, you know, logic. But, but you forgot that you have to have values. This is the way the world is. And values say, this is the way the world should be. And therefore, policy says, this is what we will do. So we really need to bring our values to this question. It's not good enough to simply describe the world and then expect people to do the right thing. You, you have to actually care. There's another philosopher that I highly recommend. No, he did not write this book or make this movie. Did you guys see this movie years ago or read the book? The Perfect Storm, okay? The Perfect Storm is this, you know, fishing town. I think George Clooney's in the movie. Uh, they go out and they're off Newfoundland or something like that. And it's like a tropical storm and a winter blizzard and some other storm comes together and there's this terrible, perfect storm. And they all die. Spoilers. But um, so based on that movie, um, a philosopher named Stephen Gardner wrote this book called A Perfect Moral Storm about the ethical tragedy of climate change. And it's, a, it's about that thick. It's a, I wouldn't exactly call it page turner. It's, it's hard to read this book. Um, I do have a like Cliff Notes version. It, you can let me know afterwards. I'll send you a PDF of the, uh, he wrote like an article years before somebody commissioned him to write this 800 page book. Um, but I'm going to reprise the cliff notes for you now in the next couple of minutes, so you don't even have to do that. Uh, the perfect moral storm. So he describes, just like the perfect storm in the, in the George Clooney movie, um, a perfect moral storm. There's three storms. He calls it the global storm, the intergenerational storm, and a third thing he calls moral corruption. So I'm going to talk just briefly about each one of these things. The, the uh, global storm is all about the separation of causes and effects. And so, so to some degree, what that's really about is us rich countries made this problem, but it's the poor countries that really get harmed by this problem, right? It, it's the people who have burned almost all of the coal and gas over history, uh, living it up, and yet you got these other people on the other side of the world who don't have toilets or showers or, you know, electricity that, that are suffering as a result. And that it's, it's fundamentally um, immoral. Uh, the fragmentation of decision making, you know, we talked about um, 
maybe we didn't talk about so much, you're going to talk about it some more, decisions made in this church about how to remodel, decisions made by our state, decisions made by our country, decisions under the UN, you know, climate framework, all that, but, but there's this whole patchwork of different actors and different agencies, and nobody can really coordinate that stuff. And then finally, uh, the fact that our institutions are just pathetic at, at dealing with a problem that's got this kind of legs, that, that, that threatens us over this kind of scale and this kind of, of, of time. The intergenerational storm is, is about the fact that it's the kids and their 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 kids that go on for so far in the future that have to deal with the consequences of the decisions we make today. And then the third thing is, is to some degree about complacency and delusion and an inward obsession that we have to, to, to sort of step back from how freaking horrible this is and, and just focus on what we can do in our own lives and, and not face the magnitude of the challenge. And this is the part, I told you this is gonna suck, this middle part, I, it, there's no way around it. The global storm, you see the colors on that map? Um, what, what colors do you see? Red and blue, okay? Uh, it shows how much economic damage is expected from climate change by, by the end of the century. And you can't see the color table, but uh, 100 is the, is the bright blue, is positive 100%, 100% of GDP. So, so places that are really cold will double their economic, the size of their economies if it gets much warmer. Like where? Canada, duh. Um, Russia, Norway, okay, they're, they're gonna benefit. On the other hand, the places that are dark red will lose 100% of their economy, 100%. I mean, you guys remember the Great Recession? The, the world economy shrank by like 3% in the Great Recession. We're talking 30 times that bad for a huge swath of the world, and it ain't an accident the places that, that turn blood red in this map are the poorest places on earth. The poorest 20% are just hammered by climate change. They don't have the resources to, to deal with it. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the money to invest in better, uh, you know, seawalls and, and different crops and irrigation programs and all the kind of stuff that you need. Hospitals, healthcare, all the stuff that we need to adapt they don't have those things. So they're just hosed. It's terrible. We have it in our power. Easily, easily in our power. Not just us, but, but all of humanity in the next two or three, maybe five generations. To burn enough coal, oil, and gas. To turn up the heat. Okay, like that one-way thermostat with the ratchet. Hotter than it's been in a hundred million years on our planet. We can do that. We, if we so choose, can make the world hotter than it's been in geologic time since the dinosaurs. Oh my gosh, that is just astonishing. To somebody who studies this, it's like, oh, head explodes. I can hardly believe this. And it lasts for hundreds of generations when you're done. Even if you get clean after, it, it doesn't go away. So this is, this is just shocking. This is the intergenerational storm. It means that we, the currently alive humans, have the capacity to do irreparable harm to a trillion people. Anybody know how many people there are on the planet? Seven and, Seven and a half billion. And I just said you can hurt a trillion of us. Because it's everybody who comes after for a long, long time. For longer into the future than the invention of agriculture is in the past. And we can hurt all of them. And we can hurt them badly. It, it, it's just shocking. And this is the intergenerational storm, the, the, the capacity for harm 
it is just staggering. I, I'm sorry, I mean, I told you this is bad. The, the moral corruption thing is that we don't want to face it, is that it, it hurts, and, and we can't deal with it. And so we withdraw, we deny, we despair, we resign ourselves, we say things like, we're screwed. Or we say, you know, in my own life, I recycle, and that's going to be good enough. I ride my bike to work. I changed my light bulbs. I'm good. I'm sorry, but that's just not enough. It, it, the problem transcends the stuff that you can do. You know, yes, you should ride your bike to work. My, my mom told me to turn off the water when I'm brushing my teeth, you know, I do that. But it's not enough. And it's not even close to enough. We, we have to engage this at the level which it engages us. We have to face our responsibilities to, to the future of, of the world. Is there hope? This is a book by Joanna Macy, highly re recommended, it's called Active Hope about climate change. Is there hope is the wrong question. So I read a guy named David Roberts. Did anybody read, read Dave Roberts at, in Vox? Awesome, his, he goes, his Twitter handle is drvox, like Dr. Vox. There is no such thing as game over, or too late, or screwed, or no hope. It is certainly not the case that we have only 12 years to act. In fact, this fight will last far beyond any of our lifetimes. Yes, you have to act in 12 years, but you're not done. You'll still have to keep acting until you die. And so are your kids and your kids' kids. The stakes will always be enormous. Time will always be short. And there will never be an excuse to stop. You gotta keep doing it. And hope isn't something that you, that you get or you have Hope is something that you do because we must. I'm not done. Because we got, got to talk about the third S. Got to talk about solvable. Because we can do this. Because we have to do this. For our kids and grandkids and those trillion other people that are coming someday. What do, what do we do? Stop setting stuff on fire! <laughs> That's it! I mean, sorry, but, but you know, basically, it, it comes down to that. that we we got to stop setting shit on fire because it, it puts carbon into the atmosphere that doesn't ever go away, and that stuff traps the heat. Okay, so it, it's, it's like Moore's Law. You guys heard of Moore's Law, right? The, the computers get twice as fast every couple of years or something like that. To limit warming to two degrees Celsius, which you all just earlier tonight said you didn't want to do, you want to go one and a half. But if you want to limit to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, you got to cut fossil fuel emissions 50% every decade, starting right now. So in the 2020s, it's got to globally fall by 50%. In the 2030s, it's got to fall by another 50%. In 2040s, it fall by another 50 and so forth. Pretty much forever. Bad news, that's going to be hard. Okay, worst news is you want to do one and a half, right? You don't want to just do two. So um, I was asked to please say a couple of words about this IPCC special report that came out last, uh, last fall. You may have heard about it. It's called Special Report 1.5, or a lot of people just call it SR15. If you look like on social media, you see this hashtag SR15. And you know, it's like 800 pages. And then there's a summary that's only 40 pages, and I'm just doing it in one slide. So this is the, the super condensed version of that very long report. Uh, basically what happened was, at the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, the countries of the world commissioned the UN to please study what would it take, well, two things. What, what difference would it make if we went for one and a half degrees instead of two degrees for our limit? And what would we have to do how hard would it be to, to, to do that? And the two things that they found were, number one, it would make a big difference. Yes, 
you should go for one and a half, not two. It, makes, it, it may be life and death for corals, for example. Cor coral reefs may be completely extinct at two degrees of global warming, but only really stressed at one and a half degrees of global warming. And that's a big difference. It's the difference of life and death for, for a kind of amazing ecosystem that's been on the planet for hundreds of millions of years. Amazing. And we can kill it off in like two generations if we don't stop. Um, it makes a huge difference for crops. It makes a huge difference for sea level. It makes a huge difference for human health. It makes huge differences across the world. It's huge advantages to, to stopping at one and a half instead of two. And secondly, instead of 50% per decade, we got to do about 65% in, in the 2020s. So between now and 2030, we got to cut global fossil fuel emissions by about two thirds instead of only by half, if you want to hit uh, one and a half degrees instead of two. So that's, that's the report. Uh, complicated graph, pathways to one and a half degrees C for the global uh, average temperature rise. In the gray there, it's all the emissions up to now. Um, emissions peak like tomorrow, maybe not today, but it, almost immediately, and then fall very, very quickly. You see that, that uh, very rapid um, reduction in emissions. But notice that the emissions go below zero by like 2050 or 2060. See how that goes to, to, to negative? So this is a, a controversial thing to recommend because nobody really knows how to do that. So not only do you have to cut emissions really, really fast, like peak emissions immediately and cut really fast, but 20 years from now, you have to roll out technologies that'll suck CO2 out of the air. And they have to be scaled up so that by the end of the century, you're sucking out about two thirds every year of what we're putting in every year now. Wow, that is so hard. The, the reason why we set stuff on fire is because energy comes out when we set it on fire, right? The reason we put CO2 in the air is because it makes energy when, when we do that, right? There's energy stored in the bonds and the coal and the oil and you got liberate that stuff, it makes civilization go, right? So, so grabbing it all out of the air and, and gathering it up and squashing it into something and sticking it where the sun don't shine, that actually uses energy. In fact, it uses more energy than you got when you set the shit on fire, right? So, so um, in order to do that, we have to have vast amounts of energy. Where are you gonna get the energy? The sun, very good. So obviously you can't burn coal to make energy to suck CO2 out of the air, that's a losing game. You, you have to have some sort of very large source of carbon-free energy to suck CO2 out of the air. And of course, if you had the big source of carbon-free energy, you would use that to keep the lights on, right? So, so by far, the cheapest, easiest thing to do is to not burn it in the first place, right? Once you've burned it, you gotta go catch it and gather it all up at tremendous costs of energy and then stick it down in the ground. So it's way better to not burn in the first place. Dramatic savings of energy and time and money and effort and all that stuff. So there's other stuff on that graph, but, but that's, the ba that's the basic thing. Now, no one has ever demonstrated the ability to suck CO2 out of the air at that kind of scale. It is certainly reasonable we, we have some ideas of how to do it, but we, we aren't sure they'll work. So that's another reason to not burn it in the first place is because we're not really sure we could do that. This negative emissions technology that scales up to so massive numbers by the end of the century. So this is, this is kind of scary. Okay, there's math here, sorry. This is, it's easy math though, it's, it's multiplication, right? You guys remember multiplication? Four numbers multiplied together equals the amount of CO2 we emit. Uh, this is an equation that was invented by a guy named Kaya, so we call it the Kaya identity. And the numbers, first number is population, second number is money per person, okay? It's, it's actually GDP, like economic activity per person, per capita GDP, we'd say. The third number is the amount of energy it takes to make a buck, and the fourth number is how much CO2 you release when you make energy. 
And if you multiply those four numbers together, you get CO2. And you can tell, because if you cancel the, the numerators and the denominators, oh, you get CO2 equals CO2. See how that works? So this is, it's, it's, it's right. Um, so, so remember, we got to make this number go to zero, right? So CO2 emissions have to go to zero very quickly. You got like 20 years to, to make CO2 emissions go to zero. So a lot of people will tell me at the end of a talk, well, it's all population. So it's true, if you make population go to zero, the CO2 emissions go to zero, but you know what? That's not okay. That is really not okay. We, we, it's not okay to kill everybody off in order to make the CO2 go away. What about the second number? That's the per capita wealth of, of people in the world. It's not okay to make that go to zero either. Right there. Did you know there's, there's one and a half billion people on earth don't have any toilets? There's two and a half billion people on earth don't have any electricity? It, it is not okay to zero out their, their income. That, that is just not okay. In fact, even for rich people, if you tell them you're gonna make their income go to zero, they're not gonna support your, your programs. So, so those first two numbers are kinda hard to argue with. You, you can't really make those first two numbers go to zero, or even the product of those two numbers go to zero. So that means it's the second, the last two numbers, really all you got to work with. And the first one is energy efficiency, and the second one is the way we make energy, right? So the energy efficiency of the economy has to be improved, and the carbon efficiency of our energy system has to be improved, and we can do that. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time, I'm sorry, I'm actually talking too long. Population, when, when, when I was a kid, we talked about the population bomb. You guys remember this, some of you do. I, I recognize people my age. Not all of you, thank goodness. But um, population growth is only half what it was when I was a teenager. Did you know that? Population growth is half what it was when I was a teenager. Population has doubled in my lifetime. It will never double again. The world will reach zero population growth by the end of this century, and we don't even really need to worry about it. It'll increase maybe 30%. And then that'll be that. But economic growth is amazing, okay? These are two pictures of Shanghai taken 20 years apart. So 1991 and 2012. And what you're seeing there is not population growth. There, there's 75 million people in Shanghai metro area. And they were very, very poor in 1991. The, the Chinese economy is... 20 times the size it was in 1991. Isn't that amazing? The, the Chinese economy has grown 2,000% since 1991. There, there's seven and a half billion people in the world, but there's only one billion people like us. By people like us, I mean rich people who burn a lot of energy. And by the end of the century, there might be nine billion people on earth, but instead of one billion people like us, there's gonna be four billion people like us. Okay, so it's not population, it's the population of rich people that is driving this, this thing, and a lot of that is good, right? These are people who are in dire poverty, and they're climbing out of dire poverty, we got to be supportive of that. That's a good thing, but if they do that on the back of coal, oil, and gas, we are screwed. Okay, buildings. This is a Green Building Conference. This guy's name is Ed Masria, and he is a, uh, an architect. And he's a famous architect. He, like, I don't know, I'm not an architect, but architects know this guy. Um, he gave a talk. I saw the talk. I was super impressed. In the developed world, mo our biggest use of energy is buildings. Okay, we, we often think about cars, and we often think about smokestack industries. But turns out, you can't really see the pie chart there, but that blue part of the pie chart, that's buildings and it's constructing buildings, it's, it's producing the steel for girders, it's you know, hauling that stuff all over the world, it's putting the buildings up, and then it's operating the buildings over the lifetime of those, those buildings. It's almost half of energy use in the developed world is in buildings. And there is an enormous amount of room for improvement in how we build and operate our buildings. In the United States, about 46% of the energy in the United States goes to buildings almost twice what we use for cars. So that's pr pretty impressive, 46%. You're 
Way back in 2005, the US Department of Energy expected the uh, amount of energy we we're gonna use in buildings out to 2030 to be increasing on that, that top line. And they made the same forecast two years later, the same forecast two years later. You can see what's happened here is basically the amount of energy that we're expecting to use in our buildings has fallen dramatically in the last decade because architects have gotten serious about buildings, about energy in buildings, about better windows, better doors, better lighting, better HVAC, better all kinds of stuff. And just that one thing alone, in the United States alone, is gonna save four and a half trillion dollars in energy that we would have wasted in buildings that we didn't need. And it's not like we're cold in the dark now, right? We're, we're okay. We're just using less energy than we used to because we're because we're smarter about it. Um, Masria started this thing called Architecture 2030, and maybe you guys have heard about this. I know you guys are super up on buildings. Um, I was blown away. The 2030 challenge, Ed Masria like, challenged his fellow architects that by the year 2030, they would promise not to design any buildings that were not net zero energy. Net zero energy means you put as much energy out on the grid during the operation of that building as you used to construct the building in the first place. So there's no net energy cost of that building for its entire life cycle. And he's got 73% uh, of the 20 biggest architecture firms in the world um, signed his pledge that together represent $100 billion a year in construction of buildings. So this is pretty awesome. And everybody ought to join up with this thing. I, I think it's awesome. Let me talk briefly about solar panels. When I graduated high school, it was 1977, uh, solar panels cost $77 a watt. So, you know, a 100 watt solar panel would be 100 times that. In the time since, I mean, I remember high school. It doesn't feel like that long ago. And in that time, um, solar panels are 200 times less expensive than they were when I was in high school. One two hundredth of what they cost when I was in high school. It, that's amazing. I mean, imagine if like cars were 200 times cheaper than when I was in high school. Um, this is the amount of sun that falls in a year in the United States and the amount of sun that falls in a year in Germany. Um, Germany gets less sun than Alaska. And Germany went from 4% wind and sun in their electricity system to 32% wind and sun in their electricity system in 15 years. Amazing, because they got serious about it. And they get no sun. Have you been to Germany? It is like gray, drizzly, nasty. Um, Colorado did, uh, uh, Xcel Energy ha had these two aging coal fire power plants in, in Pueblo last year that were, that were reaching end of life. And they, um, they decided they were going to retire them. And they went on the open market to get bids for about 600 megawatts of generation that was going to go on a Colorado grid and replace the energy that was coming from these two old coal fire power plants. And they expected, open market, that coal or natural gas would come in the low bid. And they got um, a phenomenal response to this auction. And the median price, meaning half the bids were less, for wind plus storage was two cents a kilowatt hour for electricity from, from wind uh, power in Pueblo. It's half of what Xcel Energy is currently paying to operate coal plants that they already own outright. So, so it, they save half their money the first year by, by building brand new power. It's amazing. This is not what we expected 10 years ago. The, the, the prices have come down so fast that, that new, uh-oh, you're giving me the evil eye, aren't you? Okay, <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta talk about costs. Um, I'm not an economist, but economists uh, d do this, and I read economists, I work with an economist, teach a class with an economist. They tell me that a complete conversion of the world economy off of fossil fuel will cost about 1% of the world economy. Okay, now, you could, don't know, maybe, maybe you in the front, you, you'd seem to know everything. So, so <laughs> you know how much the, the global GDP, do you know how much that is? Uh, 600 billion, six trillion. It's about $80 trillion a year. $80 trillion a year is the size of the world economy. That's the value of all the goods and so services sold in a year. 1% of that is $800 billion a year. Now that is a lot of money. 
1% of the world economy is about what our ancestors spent to retrofit all of the world's cities with indoor plumbing. Think about the cost, if you had to do it today, of like digging up every street in Paris and London and New York and laying sewer lines, knocking out all the tenement walls and putting in hot and cold running water, knocking out all the partitions in the apartments and putting in to toilets and sinks and showers. A lot, of, a lot of work, right? Boy, was that worth it, right? We, we have toilets. Um, think what it did for plumbers. Think what it did for plumbing suppliers. Think what it did for the grocery store down the street from the plumber or the children of that plumber who could use that money to go to college. Because when we spend money, it's not gone. It's, it's, it's every person's $1 of spending is somebody else's dollar of, of income, right? That's how capitalism works. Whew. I, I know, I know. All right, just for some context, okay? 1% of the world economy is about $800 billion a year. You know, who here bought a brand new phone in 2018? Oh, like three people. You guys are not doing your part, man. So, so just the handsets, forget about the data charges and all that, YouTube, um, just the handsets cost $600 billion a year that we spend on brand new phones. Um, the US military spends $665 billion a year. On new cars and trucks, we spend $2.2 trillion a year. And our roads, at about five million bucks a mile, we spent $320,000 billion on our roads. So in the scheme of things, eh, $800 billion a year, it's just not that bad, right? It's, it's, it's like phones, okay? Sure, phones are expensive. Man, my kids beat the crap out of my data plan on Verizon. My phone bill's like 250 bucks a month, it sucks. But for 250 bucks a month, I could save humanity. Oh, totally worth it, right? These are my grandparents. That's Max and that's uh, Francis. And it was their generation that did the indoor plumbing. And then we were done with indoor plumbing. They did rural electrification. Imagine the cost of running separate little copper wires to every house in Kansas and Nebraska. Holy moly, when they were done with that, they fought the Nazis. <laughs> These are my parents. That's Margie and that's Bob back in the... 50s, I guess. Their generation did 1% of the world economy on, on interstate highway system. Holy mackerel, that was a huge amount of money. And they didn't go broke doing that, right? Their generation did just fine. They, they didn't starve in the streets because of spending all that money on interstate highways. And we got interstate highways out. When they were done with that, they fought the Cold War. They went to the moon, all that stuff. Amazing, actually. This is me and my wife back when I had hair. And in our generation, we spent more than 1% of the world economy on computers, right? Uh, uh, not me personally, but, but you know, all of those computers, there, there are billions of them. Uh, every desk on earth has a freaking computer on it at $3,000 a pop. Where'd that money come from? Did, you, did we all go broke doing that? No. When we were done with that, we did mobile phones and we did the internet. All of those were 1% were kind of about the world economy. And that's what's created all the jobs in my lifetime and my parents' lifetime and their parents' life. It's what we do. It's what our civilization has done since you know, 500 years ago. We replaced perfectly good old fashioned stuff with new stuff that we like better. It, it's how the world works. These are my kids. That's Matt and that's Nate, and they get to do it again. They get to replace old crappy infrastructure that's destroying the planet and destroying civilization with other stuff that's better. More power to them, and that's gonna be where all the money comes from in their generation. Think about two different stories about how we, we talk about history, right? There's this narrative that all of us have heard kind of hangs together. You understand why people say this story. And the, the story goes that our well-being comes from stuff we dig out of the ground, right? The idea is there's value in a lump of coal and somebody sells that lump of coal to somebody else for a profit and they take that and set it on fire and they sell the energy to somebody for a profit who takes that energy and turns it into products and services. They sell it a profit. Pretty soon you got $80 trillion a year global economy. But I hope to God that's not how it really works. Because if that story is true, then either when you decide to stop digging the stuff, 
Or when you run out of the stuff to dig, the whole thing collapses. And you go back to like the Middle Ages, only there's 11 billion of you by then, and you're absolutely screwed. What a terrible, grim, tragic story that we tell each other that this is how history works. I prefer this other story. We create our world. It comes from in here. It comes from creativity and ingenuity and hard work. Not from the ground, but from the sweat of our brows and the sparks in our souls. And we are not running out of those things. And neither are our children. And they're going to be okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I talked too long. <laughs> <laughs>